So thank you very much all for being here, but particularly, of course, to Terry and Tom for the opportunity to speak before you. I like to think of myself in the American baseball analogy as a pinch hitter. Um, uh, I, I arrived, uh, I, I, I planned a month ago thinking I was doing a poster, and today I have 50 minutes to fill with a talk that was originally going to be on a poster. Um, but fortunately, uh, I've spent uh, the last five years uh, working at a, a center for sustainability that in many ways has had me thinking about what this grand challenge question is that we've been posed. How do we think about taking the tools that we have uh, as scientists, as engineers, and applying them to problems uh, of, of grand challenges and in particular to have impact in the world? And while not, it's a, n not as much of a theme of, of this talk in particular, I can tell you from having worked at the Atkinson Center, um, which is a trans university consortium at Cornell that's actually well endowed uh, and builds uh, interdisciplinary teams on campus across the entire campus. So humanists to lawyers to scientists and engineers to social scientists um, uh, and then connects them externally. And one of the themes that I'm really pleased to see that's come out uh, of this week is that many of us are connected to um, industry, to government, to NGOs, and trying to get science out of the lab, off the computer, into the hands of people that can do something. And we've heard in particular a number of people connected to policymakers, which in the end, of course, as we see in the two countries that have come up continually throughout the week, are probably the most important people to get it into the hands of. It's still not clear how we actually get them to work. I do work a lot with behavioral scientists, so hopefully some of the behavioral scientists um, can, can figure that out someday, and maybe we're getting there. Um, but anyway, this work has been funded actually in an interesting consortium of people at the United States, so from the Department of Water Resources in California, the Metropolitan Water District in, um, uh, in Los Angeles, and then the National Institute of Water Research and the United States Geologic Survey. Uh, of course, like all of us have said, I get to be the conductor. I have students that have done the work. So two former students have done all the work I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first uh, work is actually uh, Seth Schweitzer, who is still at Cornell working with me, uh, and then Erica uh, Johnson, who was at Woods Hole for a postdoc and now is at the Naval Research Lab. So I'm going to start actually with a little video. Uh, I'll explain why in a minute, but it speaks to the grand challenge. Uh, uh, this was put together by Google. Now, one of the grand challenges that surprisingly hasn't come up too much on this week is the grand challenge of funding all of our work. And we're all in environments where funding, because of, in fact, what's happening at the governmental levels, is either flat, National Science Foundation of the United States for the last 20 years of my career, yet twice as many scientists, twice as many universities trying to get into the game of academic research, um, uh, or declining. Uh, and so how do we all compete for the funds we need to solve these grand challenges? And I think the answer is, again, these interdisciplinary teams we build with external partnerships. So that Google has become incredibly interested in solving the problem of flooding. 20% of deaths worldwide are in India from flooding, where there's a lack of infrastructure to even get information into the hands of the people that would, with 20 minutes warning, be able to potentially not be caught in those situations, um, I think is a very interesting problem. We see the Googles and the Amazons of the world are obviously massively computationally based. The resources that Peter was just talking about are available in many places there, and they are picking the problems of interest to them for a variety of reasons. And uh, I think it's something for all of us to be thinking about. How do we connect with some of the players that have some new resources or computational resources or financial resources and are interested in these problems? Another aspect that I was really intrigued to see this week is several people, uh, Catherine, Nadia, uh, Nadia um, have talked about um, the sus uh, UN sustainability goals. And so I've spent the last couple of years thinking about these in particular because um, one of the challenges, a grand challenge for even someone like a, a university of the scale of Cornell, 30,000 um, uh, uh, staff, faculty, and students, is we can't solve all the grand challenges. We need to partner. In fact, one of the grand challenges, 17, is partnering for the goals. So building partnerships is critical. But one of the things that's really intriguing to me is how many of these grand challenge questions environmental flu mechanics plays a role in. So that's the ones that I think that I've seen this week. Um, obviously, you know, uh, we've seen you know, Paul talk about sustainable cities and communities. Most of our colleagues wouldn't think that environmental flu mechanics is critical, but yet from the quality of life perspective um, and from the health perspective, uh, clearly an incredibly important question, not to mention the lifeline systems that have to be brought there. Um, so I'm not going to touch on all of these, but we've seen several of them mentioned today. And in fact, then if I go one degree of separation further, I would argue that all of these are environmentally fluid mechanics relevant. So I'll just pick one that's an unusual example, perhaps gender equality. How does environmental fluid mechanics affect gender equality? But it turns out in the global south, women spend hours a day carrying water. They're the primary pipeline of water into their households. 
So if you're taking two, three, four hours a day to move water, you've just lost huge aspects of your career. So obviously educating equ equally across the globe is critical, but also we have to think about where is time going. Even if the educational system is there, someone's got to get that water. And if that water has to be collected and it falls dominantly to women, even if the infrastructure for education is there, there's not an opportunity for women to be educated. So the environmental fluid mechanics of the globe are an incredibly uh, broad way of looking, I think, across what's happening in terms of the UN sustainability goals and really anything you talk about in terms of having high impact on society. All right, so let me turn now a little bit to the questions that, um, that I've been thinking about relevant to uh, at least the original poster I was going to propose. So um, in the U.S., uh, we have the national water model, and it's actually um, uh, in a way that is similar uh, at a much less complex version uh, of what Peter was just talking about, but it is run continuously 24-7 to update what flood risks are. And in fact, they're looking at 2.7 million stream flow output points they're generating. They're modeling uh, 3,600 uh, forecasts um, uh, on 15 to uh, minute to hourly time scales, and this is used dominantly to think about flood risks as well as understanding water resources planning for our reservoir systems uh, and for people that are interested in recreational aspects of using, uh, using river systems. Obviously, these are also incredibly complex models, but because we don't have the luxury of you know, huge machines, only big machines, and because of the complexity of the interactions, much of which uh, was, uh, was touched on by Peter as well, between surface water hydrology, groundwater hydrology, digital elevation maps, uh, and generating the, uh, the outflow into what is arguably the simple problem, as we heard about the other day, that we know that the Navier-Stokes equations govern uh, the flow in the river system. Um, uh, coupling those, those questions are challenging. And how do you do it? Well, first of all, you need data. So you need basic data that's been uh, handled at uh, river flow gauging stations. And so the USGS monitors 7,000 gauging stations. Slowly they are reducing. So we have retired gauging stations in the watersheds around Cornell. We've actually resurrected some of those for our own research. Um, but it is a concern at the flat funding level that some of these data points are actually disappearing as much as, uh, as Tamai was just saying. We, we expect more data points going forward. We don't have control over what federal points totally get funded, and so we've lost some points of value. So we take this data in. It is used in, uh, to initialize the problem, to assimilate the problem. Uh, but one of the um, interesting aspects is how that data has been collected, and it's been collected pretty much the same way for the last 100 plus years. So we use current meter technology. Granted, some of it's now acoustic, ADCPs, but a lot of it still is actually handheld paddle wheels being hand taken across rivers and weighted uh, in ooh, one cut my knee. Um, a little weighting environment. And the, uh, uh, the, the approach is to make transects across the river uh, to obviously use a, a survey-based system so you know where you are in that transect. And it can be done with a handheld paddle wheel or with an acoustic Doppler current profile or in a side-looking mode or in a vertical mode with bottom tracking. And you can build up then the, uh, the mean flow rate and you know the bathymetry and, and life is good. But that hasn't changed in over 100 years. And one of the challenges when you do this is that the data of most interest is during these flood high flow events. These flood and high flow events are actually overbank conditions. You're calibrating a stage discharge curve, and you're doing that usually in environments when you can put men or personnel in the water, and so it's relatively benign. It's not the extreme event. And you're doing it almost always in situations where the banks are under or are bank full at most, but have not exceeded the bank uh, capacity. So in obviously floodplain systems, you're not capturing the calibration of that extrapolated curve, or you're not uh, of a curve, so you're extrapolating into the floodplain. And so there's a high degree of uncertainty in the most critical points. Um, so between being you know, dangerous under high flow events for uh, personnel, the inaccuracies of what's going on, and not to mention that the costs are very expensive because this is a very labor intensive process, um, it's a pretty old system that's due for re uh, re renovation. And so our argument is we should be using remote sensing to do this, and that would free things up. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the grand challenges, I think, uh, in surface flows. And, and surface flows can be sort of thought broadly um, from all surface water flows on, on the planet, because I think uh, the approach that I'm going to pitch, obviously, based on the title, is remote sensing. And with the imaging uh, available all the way out to satellite, but in particular um, from uh, the ubiquitous mounted cameras now, whether it be on a drone, on a fixed point, on an airplane, as Samai also showed, um, on a balloon, uh, I love that, th that possibility, uh, is 
very, very inexpensive now to get good images. And so we want to think about then, uh, in particular for me, how those uh, image processing tools and remote sensing could be used to deal with some of the most challenging problems we're going to face in the 21st century, access to safe drinking water, um, its quality and quantity, um, how do we meet the needs for forecasting and prediction, and how do we help teams like the United States Geological Survey meet their public demand uh, also for uh, managers, and so I'm going to talk a bit about some of the projects we've done in the Department of Water Resources, State of California, who has a mandate to make sure that fish survival in the San Francisco Bay um, meets a particular uh, limit. Uh, and so they're very concerned about not just the water that is available to be exported to Southern California, the water in California is all in the north, the population more in the south, Northern California obviously growing. Um, how do we actually um, uh, also meet ecosystem services simultaneously with meeting the water needs of the greater Los Angeles basin? And then finally, for all of us, we're very interested in discovery-based science. Uh, what are the opportunities in discovery-based science? And in particular, I think they expand broadly uh, beyond just the river systems, but to estuaries, to near coasts, to lakes, other areas that have come up all through today, and uh, I have personal interest in many of them. So how? As I've given the punchline away, I'm going to argue that remote sensing provides a powerful opportunity, and we should be thinking more and more about it. And maybe we're at the beginning of sort of the S-curve of acceleration, um, which people are saying we maybe we're at with electric vehicles too, um, and we'll see this happen. So the important question here, as Colm told us uh, as we opened up uh, at the beginning of the week, is we need, to, and there's been themes from many people, we need a lot of communication to make decisions about this. We're down to the idea of, okay, we still have finite resources. We're not going to put out you know, 50,000 cameras in a small basin. So we're going to have some number of, of images available. Where should they go? And of course, as, uh, as physics-based interested people, we have certain ideas. But obviously, as we have heard repeatedly throughout the week, model uncertainty wants to drive a lot of how this, um, this data is collected. So we need to be in a strong communication language. And in fact, I didn't write the lab up here as well, but the lab feeds a lot into this as well. And as a, we'll see that as I give the talk. So here's an example. So one of the things I tell people when I teach experimental methods is if you can see it with an eye, the computer can extract it. In fact, often if we can't see it with an eye, the computer can extract it. But if you can see it, the computer can extract it. So anything you see in the world that looks, hey, that's environmental fluid mechanics, you ought to ask the question, is someone yet using an imaging tool to capture it? So here, we clearly can see coherent structures being advected down. This is a, a Fall Creek on the north side of uh, the campus at Cornell. And uh, you can see a bit of a boundary layer coming off the left side here. I'll show another view of the same creek from a slightly different angle, a little different weather. Um, and so th obviously, the conditions change. You can imagine there's a USGS gauging station just upstream of this. So you can imagine that that stage discharge curve looks pretty different right now. But they don't know that. They're not actually calibrated for this ice condition. So the reality is we can see all kinds of flow happening on the surface. And the question is, how can we access that with images? So I'm going to now switch from that question for a moment because the optimal tool, it turns out, is infrared-based imaging in this particular case. Um, I shouldn't say I'm, I'm spectrally agnostic. Um, I'm spectrally uh, picky. I'd like to pick the spectral band that lets me see the signal the best I can and avoid challenges that emerge if I um, don't pick the right spectral band. And we'll see a little theme of that in a minute. So I'm going to turn now to the, the, uh, the work that Seth has been doing that is based on um, this need of the uh, Department of Water Resources, State of California, and the US Geological Service in Sacramento to ensure fish survivability. So what is the question? The question is, if you release juvenile salmon or you're worried about native species that are spawning upstream um, getting out through the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, uh, what are the risks? Well, the biggest risk is it turns out that we're sucking water downstate to Los Angeles. And so you've got pumps at Tracy, which is just south here. Clifton Four Bay would be here where the water comes in, and then Tracy's pumping water and exporting it south. Um, so now you've changed the pressure gradient in the system, and some of those uh, as are uh, called in California the uh, sloughs and different river systems. Um, start to actually reverse or flow at different rates than they traditionally would. And the uh, fish are se obviously uh, have some ability to swim. But if you're a one-inch salmonid, um, you can only swim at certain speeds. And between uh, mean flow and turbulence signatures, you may get carried uh, with the larger eddies to where you don't want to be 
ground up in the pumps. Um, so how can uh, that be avoided? Well, it turns out, for instance, at this junction between on the right side, Georgiana Slough and Sacramento River, um, the ideal position for a fish to be is in the Sacramento River, because if you go into Georgiana Slough, you have a much better chance, as the blue line is showing, being sucked down to the south, and the further south you get, the better the chances are you end up in, in the pumps on your way to Los Angeles. So they've been putting in these fish structures. So this is the, um, the floating fish guidance structure. Um, so to play with how do we actually modify fish behavior? And there are a variety of approaches they've taken. And so two are the, um, the floating fish guidance structure on the left, and then this uh, bioacoustic fish fence on the right. So it turned out the bioacoustic uh, fish fence, the BAF, uh, worked quite well. And it's, um, it's lights, it's bubbles, um, it's fairly energy intensive, but they were able to reduce the number of fish uh, uh, in, well, in trained in Georgiana Slough by 70%. That's pretty significant. Uh, so they were very pleased with that, other than the fact that it's very energy intensive, and there were some questions uh, sort of also locally about other aspects of this. So they really wanted to go with a more passive approach, uh, like this floating uh, fish fence. And the reality is the floating fish fence had mixed results. What's the goal there? Well, it turns out fish are what are called, um, well, they, they, they perform rheotaxis. So rheotaxis in, in animals is this ability to orient yourself relative to the flow. And so what they do is they bounce back and forth across channels and follow some signature in the fluid. The theory amongst the, um, the biologists in the, in the flow is that actually it's the, the mean shear rate in the boundary layers on the sidewalls that they're picking up on. So you can see they're turning um, sort of in the blue regions. This is actually not a mean flow, but if you look on the right, it's the number of fish per certain volume. I forget. Um, but it's number of fish per certain volume. This is all bioacoustic um, uh, measurements of fish density. And so you can see, essentially, the bright red is where the fish are going, but you see some fish leakage down here. And this is when one of the um, uh, fish structures was in place, so they're not getting much leakage. Uh, so they're able to track this carefully, and the idea is then to design a system where the fish will feel the effects of a shear uh, and end up uh, hopefully going down the Sacramento River. So the questions that we were asked were, can you measure surface turbulence to feed into our models because we want to understand the horizontal dispersion of fish that can only swim at a few centimeters per second. Um, can you figure out where the streak lines are? Because we think there's something called a critical streak line that separates when a fish will be entrained in the Sacramento River versus Georgiana Slough. Um, can you help us out potentially with other aspects, which is actually some of the areas we've been working in before? And so the answer there was, yeah, we think so. So how do we do it? We put an infrared camera out, um, and this is where it, it, it pays to have friends with lots of money. The Metropolitan Water District um, bought us a, a rather nice camera. These cameras are not inexpensive. So again, the ubiquity of these were sort of at where I think solar panels were 20 years ago. Um, the, as many of you know, the cost of solar panels has plunged over the last 20 years due to demand. Infrared cameras, if you want a scientifically accurate one, are expensive. This is a $130,000 camera. Um, why do we go with a, a camera at that cost range? We needed two things. We needed resolution. So we needed 20 millikelvin um, resolution. And we needed spatial resolution. We needed about one megapixel. Most infrared cameras that I've worked with in the past are on the order of a quarter megapixel. If you want resolution in space to resolve some of these turbulent structures, it's insufficient. So these infrared cameras are where things like particle image velocity symmetry were 20 or 30 years ago. That said, we are already seeing infrared cameras being deployed in cars for night vision. And as these applications start to grow, the cost of infrared technology is going to come down. So much like has been discussed with things like Moore's Law or my analogy to solar panels, I think we're going to see over the next 20 years the cost of scientific grade uh, infrared cameras come down to the cost similar to what we pay now for um, standard scientific grade digital cameras, which are two orders of magnitude cheaper than when I started my career. So we mounted them on top of a bridge. This is Ialton Bridge over um, the Sacramento River. Here's a view from a drone looking up, um, up the river. Uh, and then here's, uh, take my stick, here's our uh, other instrumentation that's in the water. So we've got a, a U.S. Geological Survey boat in the water that's going to be doing um, a downward looking ADCP transects. We've mounted some fixed um, acoustic instrumentation off a floating collar, so we're at a fixed elevation below the surface. Uh, as I'll show in the infrared images, we have a variety of um, ground control point targets out there that are infrared sensitive that we'll use to georeference our images. But here's what you get. So clearly, we can see a lot of environmental fluid mechanics in this image. One of the most intriguing pieces, which I'll close with, is that also clear this image is stratified, right? Every, every eddy you see is warm. And so there's whatever reason, we've got some more heat down low in the system, and it's rising up. Now, it's weakly stratified, and it's probably at the edge of passivity, given the level of turbulence. The boundary layer here is pretty well developed. This is the lower Reynolds number face, uh, case. You can actually see the uh, Carmen Vortex streets being shed off of our vertically mounted instruments in the water and the wakes coming off the piling cluster. 
Here's a higher speed flow. So now you see stronger eddies, a more fully developed turbulent boundary layer. Uh, and uh, again, you very clearly see the mean flow. In fact, if you watch for minutes you can, or seconds, you can see the, the overall mean boundary layer structure, but you can see a lot else happening. Yeah, and you can see some grand challenges in infrared. We have patterns that aren't moving. For those of you who do any kind of correlation-based analysis, you know that's sort of your worst nightmare. How do we actually find the velocity under there? So those are some of the things we're faced with. You can also see some of these uh, georeferencing targets now. So we have these targets scattered all over the image. And there's some over on the shore here. That's how we're going to georeference, and we'll talk a bit about quantifying uncertainty using those. Yep. I um, I knew someone would ask me, and I should have actually looked, but I think it's on the order of only about 0.5 c. Yeah. Now, th th and a lot of times people are, are confused of why that signature is so strong. We've always ex we've always known we'll get that signature. We've we've actually made measurements in the lab where we don't have you know strong. Uh, uh, in equilibrium, water that's been sitting in tanks for days, in controlled atmospheres. But the reality is because of the latent heat of evaporation and skin friction, you get these, you know, tenths of a degree C. And all you, 20 millikelvin, I've got 20, 30, 50, uh, uh, you know, a single noise ratio of 20, 30, 50 always. All right, so what do you do? I mean, people have been doing this uh, problem forever, but the nice thing is it's pretty straightforward to actually georeference an image. And so the main key, uh, takeaways from this is it's a two-step process. You do an intrinsic calibration based on essentially the geometry of your array. You handle the variability of the million sensors you have on the array, the optics of the system. We actually housed our system in a waterproof um, uh, uh, structure, and that structure has an infrared, um, a, v a very uh, high emissivity infrared lens on it, so you've got to do the calibration in that. But once you handle all that and you do it in the lab, you now have an intrinsic calibration, which is good for ever, as long as you don't touch the way the geometry of the camera is set up. Then, locally, when you put it in deploy, you do an extrinsic calibration, which is really just a linear systems mapping uh, to figure out where you are in space. So you'll, hear, you'll see a few times of me connecting UV, the pixel array coordinates, to XYZ, or, or often just XY, um, the horizontal position actually in what we call real world coordinates. So here's that georeferenced or georectified image, uh, and I've also located in it where some of our acoustic instrumentation is, uh, instrumentation is and you can see um, the ground control points showing up as well. So as I mentioned, one of the things we're very interested in, because of course we want to be able to make this data uh, available for modelers or several models running of this system, is what is our uncertainty? Also, how do you position those um, uh, uh, ground control points? And so we've done a Monte Carlo simulation to understand the effect of both number and position of ground control points. So here's a simple example where we've got four ground control points in this image, which mathematically is the minimum set. Here's eight, so just double the minimum set. We obviously had a lot more out there. Um, and then we've uh, taken noise on and added it to the, uh, the positions in uh, UV, in pixel coordinates, and to the surveyed in georeference points, so, so an XYZ space. Um, order a meter in the horizontal, one pixel on the grid, and then 0.1 meter in the vertical, all with uh, normal distributions. But you can see, just going from four to eight, we reduce our uncertainty in the near field from three meters to one meter. And so the more, obviously the more points you use, the better, but where you put them matters. Uh, when you're working across you know, water systems, it can be challenging to have them exactly where you want. But you also see that the uncertainty gets huge as you move far in the image. And we'll see that come up in a second. So then the question is, how do you decide you're going to, wh what tools do you use to extract these images? And one of the most common approaches is to use some sort of traditional correlation-based technique. So I've been working with those since the 90s. Um, the challenges with traditional correlation-based techniques is they tend to lock on to gradients, or not lock on, but have trouble locking on. They will slide up and down and lock onto the noise along any kind of a gradient. So when you have fronts, like you have an infrared image, you have challenges. Also, when you've got both bright and dark signal, correlation will only lock onto one, so you're losing half the information. It also turns out correlation is really sensitive to dynamic backgrounds. We have a lot of dynamic backgrounds. So one of these two techniques are, are sort of the better approaches, although you see people use correlation, it does work. But phase correlation, which is essentially a normalized correlation approach, um, or minimum quadratic difference tend to work best. We think minimum quadratic difference has a little better noise characteristics, um, so a little more accuracy, so we go with that route. Also, it's super simple. Um, so basically, you just track, uh, a re take a region in your first image, uh, look in the region of the second image by moving it around. So the red box, I'm just going to slide around inside the blue box. I can control my search domain and literally just seek the global minimum of the mi minimum quadratic difference. Uh, and then you can use uh, uh, in 
mechanism in, in correlation analysis. I mean, in, uh, in quantitative imaging, we use subpixel fits to get that, uh, the displacement better uh, at subpixel locations. So here in red is the infrared measured uh, vo transect velocity across this line. This line in black is what the ADCP has done. But if you looked at the contours, which I didn't plot on here, and this is not rectified, but the contours of uncertainty are banding out like, in fact, they're banding out like this. So as we move out here, we're getting into increasing uncertainty due to the calibration, and you see the infrared starting to break down. We're also picking up some noise off the um, infrared reflection off of trees on the shore in this region. So what I'm going to do is focus on comparing infrared over a tidal signal in just that point. So here's, uh, here's the first straight-up comparison. Um, so we took the ADCP at one bin and compare it uh, in the uh, mean flow direction to our quantitative imaging technique. And it looks like we're doing pretty well. We're not obviously looking perfect in here, but we don't expect to be. Because remember, I'm measuring on the surface. The ADCP is measuring one meter down. This is the classic challenge for people who do um, you know, open channel flow hydraulics. And it's a well-understood problem where you actually look at the depth average velocity, compare it to some other velocity measured at a point, in our case at the surface. And you essentially look at that ratio. So you can think of it as the uh, this is the spatially and temporally depth, uh, you know, average velocity. So this is the mean bulk mean flow rate divided by what we measure gives me some constant. So that constant turns out to be about 88%. And if I take that correction, in fact, we're doing brilliantly. So we're really happy with how that's working. Um, and uh, we're now the goal is to apply this um, broadly in a variety of ways. And some of those will come up in a moment. So that case, we were looking at the boundary layer. If you remember, the image didn't span the entire river. The, um, the goal there was actually to try to answer some of the biologist questions about how does that shear actually affect fish and what does the shear look like. So in this case, we're actually now looking across the, um, uh, which one are we at? We're at Sutter Slough. So uh, we're looking across Sutter Slough. We're putting georeference points on a floating barge out here anchored in. We've got points on both shores. And the camera is now sitting actually on a boom truck up at this point. We monitor its position because boom trucks, of course, shake. And, uh, and, and potentially, in one case we had them, they slowly settled down. In this case, we were actually lucky. Everything stayed very, very stable. Um, and so here's the flow we get in this case. And this is the complete river flow. And so now you can see very, very strong boundary layer eddies on the side. Obviously, we get sort of deeper on the mean. Again, we have uh, challenges of reflections of the trees. And this is currently the biggest challenge we're facing. Um, so we're working on that. So what can we do with that data set? So we can now do our instantaneous uh, approach of calculating, just like we would for a PIV or some other technique, what is the spatially resolved velocity field. And you can see, um, we've on the left, I've got total velocity vectors. You see a fair amount of noise in the pattern going through the reflection of the trees. So on the right, I've actually stopped the image um, at that point, And we're looking only at the, f uh, the, the turbulent the, uh, fluctuations. We've removed the mean flow. So of course, this, is, this has been sped up by only a factor of two. As we've seen in these eddies, this river structure is fairly slow. But if you watch over 10 or 15 seconds, you'll see eddy structures go through. You will see uh, some of the uh, uh, perturbation velocities actually flip directions. And so we're doing a pretty nice job, it looks like, of resolving the turbulent flow field. We, for sort of some sanity checks, we started looking. And this is all results that have come out in the last few weeks. Um, we started looking at things like turbulent kinetic energy, at, at least 2D turbulent kinetic energy. So here you see the signature of that tree reflection, very, very high values due to the variance in the tree. So again, if we clip that out and look only at the region that we're pretty confident, we see a little bit of uh, you know, high variance again right on the shore, which is what we would expect. But then we see this classic signature of a boundary layer where we've got a peak in turbulent intensity um, just offshore, and then it uh, decreasing with distance off offshore. And uh, this is uncalibrated data, so hence um, the, ver the uh, streamwise and transverse uh, spectra look very, very different. It's based on pixel displacements, very small here, much bigger here. But the, the important point in the sanity check we always take when we look for turbulence, and particularly environmental turbulence where we have very high Reynolds number flows, is we have a very nice inertial subrange. So we're pretty confident we're locked nicely onto the signal at this point. And as a final test in this case, we actually have an acoustic Doppler velocimeter out um, that's sitting in the blue triangle, uh, the red triangle here. So we're um, looking um, at the three beams of the uh, ADV here, and then the surface velocity components. Again, we're a little over a meter below in this case. And in fact, the, this is bottom mounted. So this is a tidally um, um, uh, 
sensitive system. It's uh, weak tidal fluctuations on the order of a, uh, about a half a meter or less, but nonetheless, it does. Uh, the depth is changing. But what we did is then took the horizontal magnitudes. We see we're tracking the larger structures, not tracking the smaller structures. A meter, meter and a half below is what we would expect. So we feel pretty good about um, our ability to resolve turbulent fluctuations at time scales similar to acoustics. All right, so that's the Department of Water Resources State of California project. The other one that sort of got me into this, uh, thinking about this problem now, uh, about 13 years ago, was conversations I had with um, Ralph Chang, who's uh, now retired from the U.S. Geological Survey in California, who's done a lot of work, some of you may know, in the San Francisco Bay um, uh, model, the, uh, the, non, uh, the hydrostatic version that was running um, for years out in California. I'm not sure if it's still the model of choice. Um, but Ralph was involved in a project known as um, Hydro 25 in the late 90s, uh, and it, the USGS realized that there was an opportunity to start thinking broadly about how can we move beyond um, uh, uh, the stage discharge curves. And at that point, ADCPs were just starting to get used, so that was a big step for them, and they've, I think, done a brilliant job of incorporating acoustics and helping them in potentially lower costs and increase accuracies, but it's still relatively high cost um, and very manpower intensive. So they looked at things like um, radar-based systems, which do a pretty nice job of getting velocity transects, challenge being Pretty coarse, you're never going to get turbulence out of that, but mean flow can be done. Uh, and the reality is you can never get flow depth out of it. So if you're in a dynamic system where you've got sediment scour or uh, other reasons that the bed geometry is changing, we've seen some pretty incredible examples of debris flow. Um, so if that bed is scouring, then of course during the conditions of most interest, your geometry has changed, your bathymetry has changed, and it's very difficult to get flow rate out. So they would use ground penetrating radar, towed across on a separate system, still manpower intensive. So this started to get at a solution, but didn't solve it. Many people since around that same period of time have been working with traditional PIV-based um, approaches. So they shine white lights or use sun. They throw um, biodegradable packing uh, peanuts, these uh, potato starch-based peanuts that Amazon likes to use. Um, and so you seed them manually. If the problem is you're sort of struck with you can only get data where the seed goes, as has been talked about eloquently in a variety of talks. Um, particles tend to not follow the flow if they're, if they're um, you know, I've uh, got enough size or buoyancy in this case. And so we see the clustering along fronts that would one would see sort of sorting, not unlike you might see in cloud physics. Um, but then they could uh, use any variety of PIV techniques to, uh, to find the mean velocity field. This, again, worked quite well, um, but it, it suffers challenges of you need a light source, you need a seeding source, uh, and it is manpower intensive still, potentially. So we started thinking about it from the perspective of infrared, um, but I was getting money back then from uh, the National Water uh, uh, Research Institute and from the USGS, and so we had about $70,000, so I just enough to pay students and not enough to uh, uh, buy an infrared camera. So we used traditional PIV techniques in the lab to prove that this could be done, and we're now applying those to the infrared camera results that we're getting in California. So the idea was to use quantitative imaging um, to, of course, measure the mean velocity profile, and then the hypothesis, which we've now proven, is that the integral length scales of the turbulence, essentially these features we're seeing, coherent structures, contain information on depth, right? They are being generated in the boundary layer at the bed. So they are depth information. How do we exploit that? And then can we use those combinations uh, uh, of uh, tool tools together to give us bathymetry and surface flow mapped back down to bulk mean flow, as we've talked about, and come up with a remote sensing flow rate? And the answer is yes, you can do it. So we do it in the lab. We use a traditional flume, we mount cameras on the ceiling and just use white lights. Better picture right here, just you go down to your local um, lumber store and buy yourself a nice halogen set of lights, so much cheaper than a laser. And uh, we're able to illuminate the surface, much like uh, the sun uh, or other illumination techniques used in river systems. This is a two meter wide flume. We did play with a bunch of different geometries to understand how bathymetry and roughness affect things. So here I've got a, um, uh, a, a lateral variation that's constant um, in, uh, in bed, so shallow, deep, a linear transition. Here I've got roughness. This is about 2.1 centimeter uh, gravel, and you can see on the far right a uh, close-up of it. And then we prov uh, apply traditional PIV techniques from just uh, surface-mounted uh, systems. And so uh, again, we can come up with the turbulent velocity field, and we can analyze that velocity field to get the coherent structures. And of course, we expect coherent structures in wide, shallow channels. Environmental flows are characteristically shallow on the, uh, you know, if you non-dimensionalize by flow depth, we're talking about rivers having a ratio of sort of 30 to 100. So we expect lots of, uh, of secondary flow circulations and essentially these cells that form, these counter-rotating streamwise vortex pairs. So in a shallow flow here, this is uh, 
Uh, about six centimeters, you see one, two, three, four, five different cells. So these are higher speed flows being invected downstream. You see the lower speed flows. We're looking at streamwise um, instantaneous velocity, lower speed flows in between. We go to a deeper flow, 20 centimeters, we see only three cells. So clearly, the structure of the flow is scaling on flow depth, which gives us a very warm feeling that we'll be able to extract some sort of integral length scale and correlate that to flow depth. Uh, and in fact, that's what we did. So we looked at the four different integral length scales you can pull out of those surface images. And it turns out, for a couple of reasons, um, the uh, integral length scale based on the correlation of the transverse velocity in the streamwise direction, so L221, um, where one is in the streamwise direction, gives us the most important information. Remember, we're interested ultimately in developing a technique that can be used to figure out lateral variations in bathymetry. So we clearly want to be doing our correlation, uh, uh, doing our uh, measurement in the in the longitudinal direction. And then it turns out, because of the signatures we saw in the coherent structure spacing, that L22 is the uh, the, the transverse velocity uh, correlation it turns out to be the best. So if we look at um, with different flow depths, so from top to bottom increasing flow depth, you see a very clear variation. This is just in a constant um, smooth channel, very clear variation of the integral length scale. So far, we're only averaging that integral length scale to get flow rate. Um, but if you do uh, a correlation then on that integral length scale versus depth, you see um, with some uncertainty, of course, you see a fair amount of uh, uh, confidence that we are picking up the depth signature. And so now if we go ahead and use uh, that approach to get our depth, and then we take the, you know, the depth average surface, uh, we take the, sur the laterally average surface mean flow and use its relationship to the essentially how strong the boundary layer has developed. So this is displacement thickness non-dimensionalized by depth. It turns out that works much better than trying to come up with some estimate of, say, delta 99, which as most of you who are at least experimentalists know is brutally challenging to actually calculate with any accuracy. So it, uh, we get a very nice signature in this case where, uh, for the known flow profile. We've actually measured delta star in this case, um, so we're using a second technique. We have now gotten rid of that need, but we come up with a coefficient to convert surface to bulk mean, put them all together, and you get flow rate that looks really quite good. So we're measuring acoustically in a pipe to about 3% uh, accuracy uh, what the uh, flow meter is registering. And then through our technique, we're measuring uh, the flow rate based on the estimates I just presented. And you can see we're doing quite well um, there. So uh, this was uh, uh, our, our first shot at doing it in the lab. And we were really pleased. And th that work's been published um, back in 2017. So the other questions that we became interested in is what else can you pull from those surface turbulence signatures? And um, again, anything you see, you should be able to extract. So many of you have, and probably everyone in the room, has walked by rivers that they see on certain days are quite clear or quite blue, brown, green. And you go by other days, and they are clearly highly turbid. And you've got a, a very turbid current running downstream. So bed stress has exceeded some sort of uh, shield's critical stress, and sediment's been suspended, of course. From a management perspective, we're very interested in that. So how can we get there? Well, Nezu, who literally wrote the book on open channel flow, um, came up with a, an empirical extrapolation of uh, uh, essentially dissipation profiles based on, uh, on bed stress or um, friction velocity. So if we solve for friction velocity based on that and use any of the variety of techniques that are common in PIV, direct estimates, second order structure functions, or spectrally based estimates of the dissipation, we can now actually infer what you star is at the bed. and so. We go ahead and do that, and in fact, you, uh, that, that came out awful. But if the, uh, this is an ADV measurement, um, and so we've taken the uh, boundary layer profile and just done a log law fit to back out the, um, the friction velocity. And then this is the predicted friction velocity based on surface measured dissipation. And you can see we're doing very well in extracting actually what the, um, the bed stress or the friction velocity is. All right, so I'm going to take the final few minutes here and touch on uh, the emerging questions again and talk a little bit about what directions I think these, these images could be used going forward and uh, uh, other opportunities. So obviously we have some open questions about how certain aspects of our flow are affected. Wind, waves, and stratification all will affect our results. And we're not entirely sure how, though we have ideas on all of it. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then given that, can we say something from these images about the wind stress, the wave field, and stratification? And I think the answer is yes. The next step for us is to think very aggressively about deploying potentially from drones or uh, the balloon idea I actually particularly love because stationary measurements are a particular interest for these point measurements and, and drones um, um, uh, are, are a little bit more challenging and have finite times to fly. Um, obviously, you can put them in aircraft. Um, I, you know, we haven't talked at all about satellite images that have come up a lot over the course of the week. There is some opportunity in satellite images to get some basic information, but resolution to date is, of course, not sufficient. 
So let's come back to the question of the, these open questions on wind stratification and waves. So in this case, we have a pretty low wind day, but we have a pretty clear evidence that this flow is stratified. And the question then is, how can we use this image to take advantage of that? And so, as Colm was asking, you know, this is an infrared image. We can actually calibrate that image of temperature. So we know what the water temperatures are across the water column because we're sampling essentially the whole water column in this image. And so can we now use structures and our knowledge of turbulence to understand what the lifetime of a particular eddy is, where it likely emerged in the water column, the thermodynamics of that being generated and understanding something about the temperature profile in this water column? I think the answer is yes, because I'll go back to my opening comment. If I can see it in an image, I should be able to extract it. Our combination of turbulence understanding and what's in this image gives me pretty warm feeling that it's doable. Another thing that I think is very interesting is that if we had a wind stress or waves on this that we thought were at least high, uh, uh, deep waves, uh, short wavelengths, um, in particularly in rivers, that's what you tend to get, uh, we have an ability to remove those effects directly from the flow. Waves are easier, I think. Wind stress is a bigger problem because wind stress, of course, is moving the free surface. And we've seen uh, you know, people adjusting free surface drift velocities in the 3 to 3.5% 3 this week. So if we're off by 3 to 3, 5%, that's big enough to uh, overwhelm the uncertainty that we would like to stay within. So again, if we take the deeper water, which has not been affected yet by wind stress, we could choose to use something like a correlation or temperature threshold analysis here and track eddies that have not spent a lot of time on the free surface. Water in equilibrium in the free surface is at a certain temperature. Water at disequilibrium has not yet seen a wind stress. So there's an opportunity here, I think, to again, to exploit the, exploit the physics and be able to understand how we might be able to um, uh, correct for stratification and measure stratification. So I, I added two slides last night after hearing Paul's talk because it really can resonated with me uh, for the work that I've been doing at the Atkinson Center and thinking about um, energy in particular, but really sort of sustainability in these uh, multidisciplinary environments. And so Cornell has a particularly unique history in the energy space of working um, often against its own board of directors and board of trustees um, to make, to push forward in, in, in energy. And so one of the first projects that we did since I've been on campus, we've been doing projects that are innovative since um, the 1900s, um, is taking advantage of Cuga Lake. So Cuga Lake sits just about a kilometer and a half from campus. Um, Cornell is, a, as I mentioned already, is a campus of 30,000 people. So we're a small city. We're a pretty good scale model. We use 1 1,000th the energy of the state of New York. So we are literally a 1 1,000th scale model of the state of New York, you know, one of the top 10 biggest states in the U.S. So if you go down to the shore, um, uh, what we've done is we've actually taken water from 72 meters deep. And 72 meters deep in Cuga Lake, we're below the internal wave field. Um, as I was telling somebody the story, I was the first uh, summer they ran this project, uh, the water intake's going from something like 5, 6C, all of a sudden it's at 11C. My phone rings. It's like, Todd, we have 11C water at the intake. We have to shut down the cooling plant. What's going on? Welcome to your first internal wave. So it was September, October. Um, so they run it through a heat uh, se seven heat exchangers. Um, we bring a campus chilled water loop down to the heat exchange building, and we meet the entire demand of Cornell campus with Re renewable uh, water um, in the lake. That has its own unique story of citizen science, um, policy, um, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation versus the US uh, EPA, because New York State doesn't believe that the phosphorus that we are recycling, we're taking water from 72 meters deep and discharging it at six meters. So we are a phosphorus pump. Um, we have shown at incredible cost to the university um, and I think some really good science that in fact the impact we're having on chlorophyll, algae, algae blooms is minimal, but yet there are algae increases happening in the watershed due mostly I think to CAFOs, uh, Concentrated Agricultural Feedlot Organization, so pigs and cows, but also to invasive species potentially. Um, and the um, but anyway, that's a sidebar story if anyone's interested in p policy, government, people, meet water. Uh, but this met um, a campus need, and it did some really interesting things. It was thought about during the Kyoto Protocol Challenge, and so we have an 86% 80 reduction in electricity to cool campus. That's obviously really nice. But from New York State's perspective, it's a 15 megawatt peak load avoided in August. This system's running flat out August, September. That's when New York City has suffered its most challenging problems for brownouts. So we've taken peak load off the system. Um, of course, we're also uh, uh, being able to do all kinds of things with respect to campus. So the amount of energy we've saved is about 10% of campus energy back in, in 2000. Um, and uh, we've been essentially flat on energy at Cornell, so it's still about 10% of campus energy, uh, total energy demand um, uh, reduction since then. So the next project we're embarking on, and so that's an obviously an environmental fluid mechanics problem. 
um, and a problem that's exportable, and there are a few examples of it. Um, D Damien and I were talking about uh, examples he's worked on. But a new project we're working on, which one hasn't really come up today, that I think fits within the broad environmental fluid mechanics context is in the groundwater uh, and subsurface regime. And that is uh, to tap, uh, in our case, what is an outcropping of relatively hot, dry rock uh, about three to five kilometers below campus. And so if you're Iceland or you're in the western U.S., obviously you have access to heat, and in Iceland's case, wet heat, um, very, very near the surface. Um, but in our case, if we go down these three to five kilometers, we're at 120 to 140 C based on some modeling and some existing um, uh, extractive industry drilled wells. Um, and so the idea is to do the same thing. It's lake source cooling turned upside down. We call it earth source heat for that reason. Many of you who may know of deep geothermal exploration or engineered geothermal explorations, that's the common name in the literature. So basically we pump cold water in, run it through porous rock, and bring it back up and run it through a heat exchanger. Very simple system, and more or less entirely renewable. 10 to 20 years, we'll deplete the heat there. We'll rotate to a new pair. This will recharge through heat flux in the, in the deep interior of the earth, and then we'll flip between two sets. So we're in the early stages of working on this system. In fact, for anybody who knows people that are interested in a job, we're hiring in a cluster hire actually for uh, the, uh, the essentially the, the geohydrology and the flows through the porous media. So, um, so that's another, I think, really interesting opportunity to think about how our field applies to the energy field. So I'll conclude there and put back up maybe emerging questions and challenges. Thank you for the for the for the nice talk. Uh, I'm, I'm I wanted to to know a little more about um, what's really the the resolution you have in the vertical of the water column when you measure from the surface. Like the IR is uh, not going through, but right. to which amount and wh how do you integrate? And uh yeah, so the the inf it's a great question. The inf the infrared actually only gets a, a few hundred micron into the surface, so we're truly on the surface which is both good, but it does mean that we're actually measuring in the surface thermal boundary layer only. So there is a, di a disequilibrium between the bulk flow and the surface thermal, so we are measuring that skin temperature. So thank you very much uh, for, the quest, uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, we need uh, to uh, couple the rivers with the ocean. We need also to measure salinity. It's surprising to me to know starting to work with the hydrologist, that really there is no f uh, systematic monitoring of salt into the rivers. And uh, so, I mean, you started from San Francisco Bay, mm -hmm. which is an important uh, place where salt plays a role, I guess, on the ecosystem. So w what is the future? I, it's a great question, Nadia. I think um, uh, you raise a really important point. And in fact, one of the things that we are seeing, again, because of the concerns about anthropogenic inputs in general into our water sources and contamination of water sources, is an increasing interest in micro uh, well, micronutrients and micropollutants, pharmaceuticals are one of the big concerns of in water sources. Uh, Cuga Lake is, um, uh, we're a dairy district, we do a lot of, uh, of uh, agricultural-based feedstock, so corn. Uh, atrazine is a huge uh, applied, uh, um, uh, uh, I can't remember if it's herbicide or fungicide, um, uh, and it's in the water column. There's not even a, an EPA standard on it. So I've got a number of colleagues that are very interested in putting together um, uh, water quality stations coupled with these monitoring stations. Um, Salinity is super cheap, so you know once you s once the USGS sets up a station, it, it, it's a shame we haven't taken advantage of that and add, you know, at minimum, conductivity sensor. And I think it's a great point. Hey, thanks. That was just awesome. Um, so I, I'm actually curious. About, so the the SWAT SWAT altimeter is going to go up in a couple years, and its intention is to measure the sea surface height gradient along rivers and get a lot of these flow rates for rivers down to maybe 50 or 100 meters. And some of your work, I think those really rely on those stage curves. And so mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you had any comments on the limitations and uh, possibly the, 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 the impact of that. Side. No, I, I think that's actually fantastic. And in particular, one of the greater challenges I see right now with something like these, uh, particularly infrared-based techniques, is to get the resolution to do a Hudson River, a Mississippi River would take drone flights, much like we use ADCPs and transects, you would do drone transects right now, which have their own challenges. So in fact, I, I think the opportunity here is at the smaller scale rivers and the slide that I realize now managed to disappear um, that was sort of connected this to the continental scale and watershed scale question is this idea that integrated watershed modeling is, uh, is becoming increasingly important. And so right now, most of the flood wave analysis done in the U.S. is done basically on a um, 
uh, essentially a, a wave-based equation. They've taken out the convective term of the 1D Navier-Stokes, the St. Benon equation. And so people like Ben Hodge at the University of Texas are questioning that approach, and they're looking at how do we actually work from, you know, the smallest tributaries to collect the entire basin scale flow down into that flood wave. And so I think his, his, his number one as a modeler concern is we should be using the full integrated Navier-Stokes equations, but also that we need tons of information all the way down the system to understand, you know, what is called the time of concentration with the arrival of the flood peak at each of these branches. And so I think, you know, satellite-based altimetry, particularly to the degree it could be sort of on the couple hour resolution, is a great solution for the big parts of the basin. And it will get it later on, but if you want to be getting forecasts that are accurate over 24 to 48 hours, you need those tributary flows. And I think that's where these technologies can actually be super helpful. Um, I, have a, I have a question, actually, about the fish. Sure. <laughs> uh, were they able to use the data you were able to, pr to provide to improve the per passive? So w we are due for the next um, uh, uh, test of a passive system in 2020 or 2021. So they're actually working with the data right now to think about it. We're, ac we're very much uh, in a crunch time to deliver a bunch of uh, analyses between now and June 1st. Uh, and but it looks like the data is already very valuable to them. And they're going to use it to a degree to verify and nudge a, an existing model, but also to think sort of fundamentally about fish structures. Todd, thank you for a great talk. So with USGS, right, as far as stage discharge curves go, how far are they into adopting this kind of cool infrared type uh, ideas for calculating flow rates? Sure. I mean, it'll be a slow transition because of the quality control issues and the operational aspects, but I think it's an area that they're very receptive to. As I mentioned, it goes back to Hydro 25 in the late 90s. They've been looking for the next remote sensing technology now, you know, going on 30 years. So uh, they're ready when it's, when it's applicable. And we have collaborated with both the Ithaca based USGS, the Sacramento USGS. Um, is USGS has funded some of this work. Um, so I think they're clearly interested if we can show operationally that it's feasible. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Let's thank the